So it's, it's good to be with you all again. Um, and I am, I'm really grateful for the work that we're putting in this Lenten season. I want to just let you know that um, today's text is a bit challenging. Um, we look at David and Bathsheba. Uh, it is certainly a text that um, reveals issues of sexual assault. There's some language. Just want to make you aware. Um, I say that not to try to get us to move away from the text, but I always think it's important for you to know what's about to happen. And, um, and today's text is just challenging. So uh, I tell you that, and I also say it, f- it feels like, or at least it felt like we were settling pretty well into chapter two. Um, all went long, we've been looking at the human condition, right? And we've been using these worship services not to simply point at where we see the human condition rising up in scripture, but also to to begin to recognize that we too um, are susceptible to sin and separating ourselves from God. That's not something that just happens to the characters of the Bible, it also exists in our own life. The academic term we use to talk about this is theological anthropology right? What is our nature? Essentially then, why do we need God as a people? As advanced as we are today, as enlightened as we may seem, right? As self-sufficient as we often act, why, why do we need God? Why do we need God present in our lives? Why do we need God's grace in our life? The answer, I think, becomes clearer and clearer if you turn on the news these days, but also becomes clearer and clearer when we begin to take scripture seriously, when we begin to realize how easy it is for us to turn inward, to live selfishly, to shun a vulnerability, to amass power at all costs, and then wield or use that power at the expense of others. We've been defining sin as anything that puts us as individuals at the center of our own story. Essentially, it's replacing God and others with self. What is the greatest commandment? To love God, right? With all of your mind, your heart, and your soul, and to treat others, right, as you would treat yourself. Often sin shows up in our life when we replace God and others with ourselves. When we begin to worship ourselves with all that we have, when we forget the needs of others in replace of our own needs. And when we elevate self to the position of God or others, we become vulnerable to sin taking root in our life. We also talked about sin being rooted in really two actions or really that there are two ways, two environments in which sin can kind of fester and grow. It's when we refuse to be vulnerable, right? When we refuse to be vulnerable, that's where sin can exist in our lives, and or when we try to amass power or abuse power. Now that's not 100% accurate, But for the purpose of understanding God's story, I really want us to kind of see these two environments as as central in talking about our own need for God revealed to us in Scripture. Because we see this over and over again in Scripture. Both the faithful and unfaithful alike struggle with sin. And to truly appreciate God's story, becoming our story, I think we have to come to a place where we realize how impossible it is for us to live without God, to, sim- to essentially live lives that are flourishing without God. We can't solve for this on our own. Next week, we're gonna spend some more time talking about vulnerability, how we understand vulnerability and why we're so opposed to being vulnerable with one another. But today is all about power and how easily, right, we can believe that having more of it, having more power is a worthy pursuit. And the problem is found in the pursuit of power and then, um, as we see today, what we do when we have it. Our scripture focuses on King David, his lust, his abuse for power, his abuse of his privilege, his abuse of Bathsheba, 
And then it turns to God's response. I'm essentially going to read two portions of the text. I'm going to read the account that we have with King David and Bathsheba. Then I'm going to paraphrase a bit. And then I'm going to read God's response that is delivered to David through his prophet, Nathan. So 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all of Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman and it was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after a period and then she returned to her house. The woman uh, conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Certainly the pregnancy here complicates matters for David, obviously. And so the rest of chapter 11 is really about David trying to cover up for what has happened. He brings Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, uh, back from the front lines of battle with the hope that he will sleep with his wife, and he doesn't. The text spends a lot of time on this tale of twisted fate. Um, The text compares Uriah's commitment and honor and willingness to serve, specifically serve King David with David's own drunken on power kind of lifestyle and David's shedding of responsibility, right? So to cover up David's own sin and who the father is, David sends Uriah back into battle and essentially has Uriah killed in an ambush. And here is how God responds in the 12th chapter. And the Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him. And Nathan said to David, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, it grew with him, and with his children it used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who'd come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the rich man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judea, and if that had been too little, if that hadn't been enough, I would have added as much more. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. This narrative in 2 Samuel, no doubt, is really hard. And let me be clear, this text does involve sexual assault. Because regardless of consent, this story involves power. David has unlimited amount of power in the text and consent must always involve an ability to say no without consequence. That is not present when a king calls for a woman to visit him. Scripture reveals the dark and twisted depths of the human soul and often I think we try to get away from it naturally because we don't want to deal with texts like this, 
Part of that is because who wants this experience with scripture? And part of it is because we are tempted to elevate scripture to the fourth person of the Trinity. And we can't have scripture then making us uncomfortable. And so this text is often skipped over when we lay out the myth-making and the stature we apply to King David. But if we do end up reading it, if we end up involved in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and chapter 12, historically the church has, um, has found some convenient interpretations for the text. The first is as old as time itself. You simply blame the victim. The other is to define this affair as an act of love. But I think we know better. The text does neither, and really neither should we. Ultimately, I think our task this morning is to acknowledge that David committed serious sins as he was settling in to being king. And I think we can get there because there is no excuse for what happened with Bathsheba, no excuse for the cover-up, no excuse for David's power trip. And while this story is about lust and desire, it is ultimately a story about power. And the first sin David commits in this narrative has nothing to do with Bathsheba or Uriah. The text says that David has sent his army out into battle. All of Israel is sent out to the front lines, except for King David. King David, the one who, uh, who slayed Goliath, right? decided that he no longer needed to lead from the front. Think about that. David used his enormous amount of power to have others do the hard work for him. In fact, it was Uriah, as a Hittite, who is a hired mercenary in the text. Uriah is brought to fight David's battles for him. The sin of abused power compounds and quickly gets out of control. It reveals, I think, a real ugliness of David. He can have whatever he wants as king of Israel. He can have whatever he wants. But unlike Jesus, who was given the same opportunity as we read about on Ash Wednesday, unlike Jesus, who refuses to take advantage of the power presented to him, David is overcome by power seduction. It highlights something that we must all recognize, that even the faithful, even the anointed, even the chosen, the folks after God's own heart are capable of doing awful, awful things. Power and the ability to get what we want, to remove ourselves from responsibility, to chase after what we desire by replacing God's provision with our own abilities. This is the human condition. This is what we mean when we say we are what we are. We're all capable of being seduced by power and then wielding it in horrific ways. But make no mistake, it's not an excuse to simply say, well, that's who we are, right? It's not an excuse because there are very real consequences that follow in this narrative. And we begin to see that there is no sin that doesn't have a compounding effect. There is no such thing as a personal individual sin, right? We are all connected, we all live in community, and we all have the ability to wield whatever power we have in significant ways and do harm to others and to the broader community. And there are, friends, you know it, there are plenty of examples of David's in our midst, in our world. From politicians, to celebrities, to C-suite execs, the world is filled with David's abusing power. And the responsibility of the church is to call it out. It's to call it out. The problem is, the inconsistency in which the faithful do so. I don't remember all that well 
Bill Clinton's time in the White House. I don't remember the affair, but I do remember how quickly those in churches were calling for his resignation, and I agree. He should have resigned. I'm not sure I had that view at age 10. I was really busy playing with Legos or building forts for my Ninja Turtles. But as I've grown up and I've formed my own opinions, it was a serious abuse of power. Newt Gingrich and I agree on this. What 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 invalidates the church as a whole is when we have folks standing in front of cameras and microphones who use scripture to rightfully denounce the Clinton scandal but refuse to do so for Donald Trump. That hypocrisy is significant as to why the church is seen as outdated and fraudulent in today's culture. We have let a political hacks abuse the gospel for political gain, and the church must regain a commitment to speaking truth to power regardless of who needs to hear that truth and who is in power. Because not only did David's original sin, that being so powerful he chose not to lead, his power and sexual assault and hired murder, not only was that enough, but here's what's even more astonishing from the text. David wasn't even aware of the damage he was doing. None of that seemed to rattle him in the text. So drunk with power was David, he had no remorse, no appreciation of the gravity of the situation and enter into the story then God's prophet, Nathan. And Nathan tells David a story, a parable. A rich man has a bunch of sheep. A poor man only has one sheep. A stranger wanders into the rich man's home And to fulfill what is required by law to feed and care for the sojourner, the rich man doesn't slaughter his own sheep, he takes that poor man's sheep. David hears this story and can't believe that the rich man did that. And Nathan, like only a prophet can do, looks at King David and says, you are the man. That's you in the story. You are the man. I don't know, but I believe our ability as a church begins with an understanding that you are the church. That you are the church. What we can't do is get so obsessed with the sins of others that we don't look after ourselves. How does a church regain its moral authority in the world? It starts with us paying attention to our own lives. It's easy to read this story and see how bad David messes things up. With a modern day reading of 2 Samuel, we can condemn David and recognize how easily power creates an environment of sin. King David in this story, right, and his actions are horrendous. But scripture isn't given to us so that we can simply read it in this manner. We aren't meant to walk around pointing fingers at all the characters in the Bible and essentially scapegoating the sinners in our own story. I'll actually talk about scapegoating more in a few weeks, but as for today, we aren't meant to hear this cautious tale of David and leave church simply thinking that David was a really bad guy. He was, newsflash. That was horrendous in 2 Samuel. But that's not why we have the story. Allowing God's story to become our story is much more than a voyeuristic reading of David and Bathsheba. It is an invitation for us to examine our own power, to think about how we use it and rely more and more on God's grace to help us do what Christ does to essentially give that power away. The only holy thing we can do with power is empower others. 
the only holy thing we can do with whatever power we have is to empower others. If the church wants to regain its status as Nathan in the world, we as members of the church, as empowered disciples, as receivers of God's abundant grace, we have to then start with ourselves. Too often my story is wrapped up in finger pointing. I blame mothers too quickly with allowing, without allowing myself to be convicted of my own failings. Wow, look how bad David is, right? Or, whoa, you think this is my fault? This is how a lot of my arguments go at home. <laughs> you think this is my fault? Well, here's a laundry list of things that you're doing wrong, all right? Or what in the world were they thinking? I would have never done that, right? We deflect so we don't have to admit that the power we have does, demands the same attention and care we expect from others. It is the human condition. We are who we are. Like Adam, we blame Eve. And we can't save ourselves. Only God can save us from this predicament. And the good news is God's story can indeed become our story because God's love outruns, outlasts our failings and our flaws. And we'll get to that on Easter morning. So between now and then, I want you to spend a little time thinking about these three questions. Three questions for you to write down in your journal. Begin to take an assessment of who is at the center of your own story. Question one, who is at the center of your story? Question two, what power do you possess right now? What power do you possess right now? And question three, how are you using that power? God's story can only replace ours when we get serious about seeing and believing how much we need a new story. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we know that there are examples in our world right now in which people are abusing their power. And there are opportunities for us as a church and as followers of you to call it out to be bold in our proclamation, to show others how seriously you demand better from the world. But before we point a finger, may we take an inventory on the places and in the ways that we have an enormous amount of power and continue to fail to live up to what you desire. May we do all we can to listen to victims, empower others, and work to eradicate our own lives, our churches, and our communities from whatever abuse exists because folks don't know how to use the power they have and may it start with us. It's in Jesus' name, the power of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen.